distinguished members of the World Heritage Committee, dear Director Rossler, members of the Secretariat of the Advisory Bodies, ICOMOS, IUCN, and ICRAM, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the chairperson of the committee, Her Excellency Sheikh Ahaya, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this orientation session. Much to her regret, Her Excellency Sheikh Ahaya cannot be present with us for our first meeting as she is retained due to protocol reasons. She will be joining us very soon. My dear colleagues, As you know, this is the second orientation session for committee members. As you will remember, we have already had one session last May in, at UNESCO headquarters. These meetings allow more opportunities for exchanges and more time for preparation of the sessions. As you know, Orientation sessions are notably dedicated to new committee members and jointly prepared by the World Heritage Center and the three advisory bodies. Their aim is to assist the committee members in the preparation for the committee meeting and in the best possible conditions. They aim to contribute to objective decisions by committee members and help to familiarize themselves with the relevant procedures, notions, and topics related to world heritage. Hence, these orientation sessions are most valuable to help reaching the most appropriate solutions concerning the issues that we will have to address during the next days. I am now happy to give the floor to Mrs. Uh, Rosler, Director of the World Heritage Center, and after she speaks, I would pass the floor to Mr. Joe King from ECROM, who will guide us during this session. Madam Rosler, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, dear members of the committee, observers, advisory bodies, ICOMOS, IUCN, uh, ICROM, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to join our Vice Chair for thanking you to come to this session, especially as this year we have a number of new committee members. And this meeting, as well as the one we did already in Paris on 17th of May, help us to better prepare and share some of the views, approaches, and general discussions prior to the session. Uh, this one here now is especially important to inform you on the details of the session, uh, which starts tomorrow at 10 a.m., the procedures and processes, but also to test the room. So this is your chance to test the room if everything works well. Um, I would like to have a plea uh, to you. Please uh, inform us of anything we can do to improve the functioning uh, at this room and to assist you, especially uh, the committee members. It's a testing phase for all of us, for the microphones, the lights, um, the equipment. And finally, please smile because you are live streamed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rosler. I now pass the floor to Mr. King. You have the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Chair. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the orientation session uh, connected with this, the 42nd session of the World Heritage, uh, of the World Heritage Committee. Um, as has already been mentioned, um, we had an orientation session which already took place in Paris uh, about a month or so ago. Uh, and so um, that session went more in depth on issues related to outstanding universal value and nominations and state of conservation. Um, because this session is taking place immediately before the, um, the committee session, this orientation session will focus more on, as uh, Madam Rosler already said, um, the procedures, uh, voting procedures, um, 
uh, order of speaking, all of the issues that you will need to know to actually uh, carry out uh, this session uh, over, the next, uh, over the next week. Um, we will also do some a brief reminder in relation to outstanding universal value and some of the nomination and state of conservation issues, but the main focus of this will be on, on the procedural issues related to, um, let's say, to the carrying out of this, uh, of this committee meeting. Now, we have a, a relatively short amount of time or a shorter amount of time than we had originally foreseen uh, due to the need, uh, due to the change of time for the, uh, uh, for the opening ceremony that will take place later this evening. And so um, we'll try to move this session along um, as, quickly, as quickly as we can while still giving you all of the information that you actually do need uh, as, uh, members of the, as, uh, as members of the committee. And I would say for some of you as new members of the committee since there was an election uh, at, the last general, at the last General Assembly. So um, having said that, I'll, st I'll cut off my, my uh, introduction at that point. And at this point, I would like to give the floor back to Madam Rossler, uh, specifically to make an introduction in relation to the venue and to look at the agenda and the timetable. So I'll pass the floor back to the center. Thank you very much, um, Mr. King. Um, now we go to the introduction to the venue. Uh, next slide, please. Um, first of all, the documents uh, which you need uh, to have in front of you, especially the committee members. Everything is available, as you can see here on the screen, on our web page. But the most important documents, um, uh, next slide, please, are all in the basic text, which, of course, is the uh, convention the operational guidelines, and importantly, uh, the rules of procedures for the committee. Don't use the rules of procedures for the General Assembly. This is not the time here. Now, um, all these documents, next slide here, um, have been um, put also on a stick, which you can download on your computer uh, by the Bahraini uh, authorities. But the best uh, access is here from our web page um, for the 40 to come. Next slide, please. Um, this is an important reminder from Tuesday onwards. We have the bureau sessions every morning from 9.30 to 10 o'clock in the RIFA room, which is the bureau room. And um, the plenary is then uh, here in this room um, from uh, 10 uh, to 1. Um, then from Tuesday onwards for four days, we have the budget group at lunchtime in the RIFA room, which is the bureau room. And uh, from uh, 3 uh, to 6 o'clock, the plenary here in this uh, room. Your key documents uh, to organize yourselves for the session is, of course, the agenda. The timetable even more important because then you see the order of the items we are taking on and the list of documents uh, including the latest revision and the latest documents um, which um, will be distributed here at the session. Now uh, on coming to one of the key items, um, the order of discussions uh, of state of conservation and the order of discussions of nominations. This is actually a question which is asked by many delegations. When is my state of conservation report coming up or my nomination? So we go this year from cultural sites to mixed sites to natural sites. And the order of the discussion of the state of conservation is from Asia Pacific to Europe, North America, Latin America, Africa, and the Arab region. The order of nominations, uh, you can also see uh, in your document uh, 8B, there is a table with the order of nominations, again from cultural to mixed to natural. And we start with the African region, go to the Arab uh, region, uh, Asia Pacific, Europe, North America, and then uh, Latin America. Um, as you remember, the committee discussed that. They wanted that we shift regions so that we all not start with the same region every year. Now, next slide, please. Uh, every day, uh, lunch break, um, the break uh, in the evening, we have uh, side events and exhibitions, which will be announced here. And um, uh, this is the attendance is, of course, free of charge for all of you. And um, you, we will be very happy to see you at these side events. There is a web page where you can look um, uh, at the table of all the side events, but we will also announce them. 
Uh, next one, um, this daily schedule is on the screen and we have a total of um, uh, 18 site events um, organized by um, the uh, um, UNESCO or the host country, 16 site events organized by the advisory bodies and uh, four exhibitions. Um, then I would like to also indicate on the working groups uh, that this year we have no operational guidelines group. We have just a budget working group and uh, which will discuss a number of key issues uh, following also discussions you already had throughout the year for uh, the committee members and a number of state party observers through the ad hoc group which was meeting in Paris. And here you have the uh, next slide please. Um, uh, you have the, uh, I thought there was a slide on the budget group uh, where it's meeting in the RIFA room of the Bureau. And that's all I would like to say as an introduction to the session and my colleague uh, Mrs. Tocharova uh, will now uh, follow up on the procedural matters on conduct of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rosler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, with regard to the procedural matters and conduct of the committee, it's uh, actually, uh, we have already held one orientation session this year, but we had left those matters to be addressed uh, immediately prior to the committee so uh, that committee members uh, may refresh all their knowledge about the procedural issues. Uh, first of all, uh, on the procedural matters, uh, I hope that all of you have a copy of the basic texts of the Convention, which contain also the rules of procedure. And uh, the rules of procedure of the committee itself, you can find them on the page 25 uh, of the rules of procedure, both uh, in the English version et la page 14 des orientations dans la version française. One of the important articles to start with uh, uh, concerning the, the, the procedural matters is the role of the chairperson, the role of the vice chairpersons and the rapporteur. And I'll draw your attention to, um, to Article 14, which uh, outlines those, uh, those duties. And uh, uh, the chairperson basically, uh, in addition to exercising the powers which are conferred upon him elsewhere by the present rules, the chairperson is the one that opens and closes each plenary session, directs discussions, ensures observance of these rules, accords the right to speak, puts questions to the vote, and announces decisions. He rules, uh, or he or she rules on points of order, and controls the proceeding and the maintenance of order. Now, there is an important uh, question that is often asked, what happens if the, the chairperson has um, has to be replaced. This issue is uh, addressed by Rule 15 of the, uh, of the Rules of Procedure, according to which if the chairperson is unable to act at any session um, of the committee, his functions, we have to check the gender balance here, <laughs> uh, his functions, that is his or her functions, shall be exercised by a vice chairperson in the English alphabetical orders of the state members of the Bureau commencing with the country of the chairperson. So we, we, we have an evidence here how it works today uh, because the chairperson, um, Sheikh Hayek, has been retained for protocol reasons and uh, the vice chairperson of the country starting with the letter following, the letter of the, the, the host country, the country of the chairperson, is ensuring the, the chairman, uh, chairpersonship today uh, concerning, uh, with regard to the Bureau and the orientation session. Um, other important matters uh, to, be, uh, to be addressed um, are the speaking order and time limits. Uh, you know, that's a very important point. It comes up at every meeting. Every chairperson is facing a, the issue of time management. And uh, according to standard practice and uh, that there is, a, there is a limit of the interventions to be made um, by the committee members for their first intervention and any subsequent intervention and the interventions of observers which might be states parties or uh, other observers, that is NGO or NGOs or other observers. Um, 
The speaking order is exactly like that. First, the committee members, advisory bodies, then states, parties, observers, NGOs, and other observers. Uh, typically, um, that depends on the chairperson, but typically that would be three minutes for the committee members for a first intervention. And uh, there would be two minutes for a second intervention of committee members and uh, two minutes for observers, be it states, parties, or NGOs. It is, um, according to the rules of procedure, it is, uh, it is the chairperson who gives the floor, and the question of uh, taking the floor um, is addressed in, uh, in, uh, in the operational uh, guidelines. Uh, often the question comes up, uh, whether a state party which has, uh, let's say, a nomination to be examined or a state of conservation report to be examined at the session, whether they can take the floor or not. And the reply to this question is specifically with regard to nominations. You can find in Rule 22.7, um, according to which representatives of a state party, whether it's a committee member or not, uh, may be invited by the chairperson to present their views after the advisory bodies have presented their evaluation of the site proposed by the state for inscription. The presentation, and this is very, very important for all committee members and states parties alike, because the presentation shall be limited to a clarification of an update on the proposed site, or an update of the proposed site. After this permitted time, the state party may be allowed to take the floor again, but only if a question has been asked to it, that is to reply to a question, and within a limited time uh, to provide the information it has been requested for. Uh, this provision also applies to other observers mentioned in, um, in Rule 8. This is, uh, this is very important uh, to note when states parties can talk uh, when the property on their territory is concerned and uh, this uh, this rule also clarifies that the the time that they allotted should not be taken for advocacy but only a clarification of uh, uh, of certain issues on their site or any new additional information um, we already mentioned, next slide, uh, we, I already mentioned the, um, the time limits. Typically, this is three minutes for committee members, two minutes for observers. And that would be operated by, uh, by a timer, by a sound system. Uh, and we shall be, shall be very strict uh, with the sound system to ensure, to facilitate the chair uh, in her efficient time management. Uh, questions that often come up and uh, I'd um, also invite you to consult to, to um, uh, make yourself acquainted with the, with the respective rules of procedure, the quorum and points of order, the, the quorum, the, the relevant art, uh, rule concerning the quorum is 17.1. Uh, at the plenary meetings, a quorum shall consist of a majority of the state's members of the committee. That is uh, when we have, uh, we, we need to have at least 11 committee members present in the room um, in order to have the quorum. Uh, points of order, that's something which is uh, also not always very well understood. Uh, during a discussion, any state member may raise a point of order, and when such a point of order is raised, uh, it will be immediately decided upon by the chair. The rule is, uh, or the, 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 not only the, the, the rule which is not uh, described as such in the rules of procedure, uh, but uh, the principle is that points of order are exactly what they are. They concern procedure. They do not concern content issues. They concern procedure. And the chair is expected to rule immediately. And if the chair has not ruled immediately on the point of order, he, he or she cannot come back to it at a later stage. If that's been missed, then the work continues this way. Um, 
consultative bodies, uh, consultative bodies, working groups, subsidiary bodies. I think that has been uh, that matter has been addressed uh, by uh, by Dr. by Ms. Ms. Rosler, uh, the director of the World Heritage Center, with regard to our specific groups that. Uh, we, we shall have at this committee. Uh, there is a general rule about uh, consultative bodies, and this is rule 20. Uh, this is rule 20, uh, 21, 22. The committee may create such consultative bodies as it deems necessary for the performance of its functions. The composition and terms of reference, including mandate and so on, of such consultative bodies shall be defined by the committee at the time of their creation. Um, what we are constituting tomorrow, or what we shall be constituting, is actually not a consultative body. This is a subsidiary body. And subsidiary bodies um, are uh, outlined uh, in Rule 21. The committee may establish such subsidiary bodies as it deems necessary for the conduct of its work within the limits of the technical facilities available. Uh, the composition and the terms of reference of such subsidiary bodies shall be defined by the committee at the time of their creation. These bodies can only be constituted from amongst states, parties, members of the committee. Um, amendments. Amendments, um, you'd, be, uh, you'd be certainly, all of you, interested how, uh, how, how it will work, how we shall organize our work with the amendments, as uh, undoubtedly there would, be, uh, there would be a certain number of amendments at least uh, during the session, and uh, usually they go to a quite uh, a large number. The relevant rules, in order to, to, to make the presentation shorter, given the, the, the little time that we have, the relevant rule is um, Rule 23. At the request of any member of the committee, supported by two other members, discussions of any motion, resolution, or amendment may be suspended until the written text is circulated in the working languages. There is, uh, in, the, in the last paragraph of this rule, it is um, also provided that new draft decisions or proposals or amendment need to be made um, uh, whenever possible, need to be submitted 24 hours in advance uh, prior to the discussion of the agenda concerned. And uh, the rapporteur shall work closely with the secretariat in this regard. Uh, now, as you can see, uh, the, the rule says whenever possible, uh, but it is important, it has been uh, indicated by the chairperson during the bureau meeting today and uh, possibly at the opening tomorrow, that is, it's of utmost importance uh, to submit any amendments or substantial proposals that you may have well in advance uh, by respecting the 24, the 24 hours um, timeline uh, in order to ensure an informed and transparent discussion so that the secretariat by working with the rapporteur uh, can, can prepare the text, can translate them, can um, uh, make the copies, distribute them uh, and uh, put them, up, upload them online so that they could be easily accessible uh, to the committee members and, um, of course, also ob observers. Uh, many of you who have uh, been members of the committee or attending the sessions of the committee over the years, uh, you know about these amendments uh, and you call them the, the, the blue paper because all amendments are traditionally, are traditionally printed on blue paper so that they can be easily recognizable. Uh, they would be distributed to the committee members and they would be available in the room. Uh, and as soon as possible and as, as much as uh, uh, the, technical, um, uh, the technical conditions allow, they would be made available um, online. Uh, what is very important for the committee members, I want to draw your attention here. It's uh, 
preferably all these uh, all these amendments have to be submitted or preferably they should be submitted um, in electronic format the secretariat will send the blue paper electronic format the template to all the delegations uh, of the committee members uh, so that you have them at your disposal and then you can prepare your amendments and send them to the email of the rapporteur that you see in, in front of you. Uh, meanwhile, the Secretariat will also consult you to make sure to which email addresses he has to send, uh, we have to send these blue forms. Voting is another, um, is another major issue and uh, the voting major issue hopefully we don't have to vote, you know, this committee is a committee that uh, mostly over the years has functioned on the basis of consensus and very rarely the voting procedures have been used. Nonetheless, voting, it's important to be aware how voting works and um, you, have, uh, you have the relevant articles describing the voting procedure, the voting rights, the voting, the, the majority. Um, in rules starting from 30 from 35 until until 42 and this uh, sub chapter or chapter is chapter 7 which is uh, voting um, voting rights you know all of you committee members uh, have one vote in the committee um, after the chairperson has announced the beginning of a vote no one shall or can interrupt the voting, except if this is a point of order. Uh, a very important point, majority. It's two-thirds majority, rule 37, two-thirds majority, uh, on matters covered by the provisions of the convention, and a simple majority on other matters. Now, the question often comes up, what is uh, actually matters covered by the convention, what is not matters, what is other matters. And just to give you one example, and this is just simply an example, uh, let's say uh, when, when the vote is about placing a property on the list of world heritage in danger, of course this is a matter covered by the convention. And of course the majority is a two-third majority. While if you are discussing whether you and you want to vote, whether you want to stop for lunch at one o'clock or at two o'clock in the afternoon, then it's just a simple procedural matter and a simple majority is needed. If there is no agreement whether a matter is covered by the convention or not, then there can be a preliminary vote between you to decide whether a matter is covered by the convention or not. Um, do we have more about voting? Uh, it is um, important to note Rule 39, counting the votes. States parties present and voting shall mean states parties casting an affirmative or negative vote. This is to remember and to recall that abstaining from voting shall be regarded as not voting. Uh, I'm not sure that we have to give an example here, but uh, we can very well give the example. Uh, 21 committee members, of which all are here in the room, but only one part cast votes and the other part abstain. And if we have seven states uh, committee members that have abstained, of course, that would reduce the required majority, that be two thirds or, uh, or a simple majority. So you have to be well aware that if you decide to abstain from a vote on a given matter, you, have vote, you would be considered as uh, non-voting uh, non and uh, the majority, required majority, a cap will be lowered. A secret ballot, a decision shall be voted by secret ballot whenever two or more states parties shall request uh, to do so. 
um, we can have a, we can there, there could be um, a secret ballot you see on the um, uh, on the on the screens in, in front of you we have the the ballot box uh, if needed hopefully hopefully we'll continue our good traditions to work uh, based on consensus um, Yeah, if we if we move to the next uh, to the next slides, uh, uh, we have a slide with simple majority. Maybe we can just put it on the screen uh, to give uh, to give the examples about the votes, um, and that's the simple majority uh, slide. So, if we have 20 recorded votes, 11 are required for the proposal to pass when we are deciding whether to break for lunch at one o'clock or at two o'clock, you know, to give my previous example, on a, on a case that's not covered by the convention. So what we need is 11 votes at least in order to, um, for the decision to pass. And m the last slide here, uh, the two-thirds majority, you can see if we have 20 recorded votes, then what is proposed, uh, what is required for a proposal to pass are uh, 14 votes, two-thirds. Uh, in that would cover the case of the inscription on the danger list, that would cover the case of um, delisting, and that would cover other, other you know, ser serious um, issues that are covered under the convention itself. Um, I think that was the last slide on procedures. And there might be there might be questions on those matters. We may need to come uh, back to them uh, during the session itself. We shall have at that time the legal advisor present with us, uh, who can provide uh, more more precise uh, information and interpretation on uh, on the issues at hand. But feel free um, now or at a later stage to ask questions if you have any. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Rosler. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mrs. Tocharova. And as I thank you, I would ask you if there are any need, uh, if there is any need for further clarifications on your side uh, on the explanation that has just been given. I can see Australia. Yeah, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and in the spirit of the, the testing of the room, I just would make an observation that uh, if there continues to be camera wobble at, behind you, um, we may need a budget for uh, seasickness tablets for those of us who are watching the screen. Um, just uh, wanted to get some guidance, please. Uh, in amongst uh, all of the papers, there are a number of uh, pieces of advice coming from the advisory bodies about the, uh, the procedures around both uh, state of conservation uh, and uh, around the uh, nomination process and in particular uh, the assessment of nominations, the time frame, the referral and deferral uh, process. Uh, anything relating to state of conservation uh, self-evidently can be dealt with under uh, General Decision 7, but there isn't uh, an equivalent general decision in relation to the nominations process. So uh, there, there are recommendations for an extension uh, by 12 months from ICOMOS of the time uh, taken to assess nominations. There are some observations about uh, the need potentially to uh, review uh, the referral process uh, in the context of the uh, reopening of the operational guidelines uh, at the next uh, committee meeting. It would be good to understand if uh, we were to seek to bring forward uh, a, re a, a draft decision for discussion, uh, where uh, in the agenda that would happen? Would we ideally bring it forward at the opening of, uh, of agenda item eight?
Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and thanks to Australia for the question. Uh, it is, of course, up to the committee to decide this, um, but you would have different options. Um, and I agree with you, uh, it was a very wise decision of the committee to have a general decision on state of conservation, which is decision number seven. Um, and if the committee wishes to decide to have a general decision under item 8B, for example, or 8, um, uh, I would suggest that you consult among yourselves to come up with such a decision uh, throughout the debate. Um, and we would actually appreciate that because that would provide more guidance to the Secretariat. Thank you. Well, I would now ask if uh, the advisory bodies would uh, like to add uh, any comments to the explanation Madam Proster has just given. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, we in the advisory bodies would, would support such a, an initiative. Uh, I think um, the opportunity to look at uh, the more strategic issues, the, the reform processes uh, that are under, under discussion through various mechanisms uh, I think would find a, a more logical home uh, in, in such an approach. So um, from AUCN's point of view, we, we would support uh, that type of initiative uh, if it was brought forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any more comments, questions? Pass to you. Thank you so much. I would like now to pass the floor to Ikram, who will also make uh, his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I will now make a brief presentation on outstanding universal value. Uh, we like to do this at every orientation session um, simply to remind committee members that this is really the basis on which almost all or all of your, um, of, of your decisions will be resting, and that is true for state of conservation, it is true for nominations, and it is true for most of the, most of the discussions that you, that you will have uh, before you uh, o over the course of the next week. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Um, now, before I go specifically into, into OUV, uh, Outstanding Universal Value, again, just as a reminder, um, we always talk about the World Heritage Convention, but the truth of the matter is, is that the convention is actually called the Convention Concerning the Protection of the World's Cultural and Natural Heritage. And I've underlined, as you can see on the screen, the word protection, because in the end, the listing of a property on the World Heritage List is only the first step in what should be uh, a process of protection um, which goes to future generations. And so I just want to outline the fact that, again, although the most exciting part of these meetings is putting, you know, putting new sites on the World Heritage List, but that really what the convention is about is protecting the world's cultural and natural heritage. Next, next slide, please. Uh, according to the operational guidelines, uh, outstanding universal value means cultural or natural significance, which is so exceptional as to transcend national boundaries and to be of common importance for present and future generations. Uh, and as such, the permanent protection of that heritage is of the highest importance to, to the international community. So that, that's really uh, the purpose of, of, of our coming together here once a year uh, to, uh, a, 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 for you all to come together here as the World Heritage Committee uh, on an annual basis. Next, next slide, please. Um, now, you've all seen this, uh, this diagram before, which uh, I need to credit IUCN for. Um, which talks about what are the three pillars of outstanding universal value. Well, if you look at the operational guidelines, and you'll see the parag relevant paragraphs in the blue dots, so it's 77, 78, and 79. In order to have outstanding universal value, it is important for a property to meet one or more of the 10 criteria uh, which are uh, established within the operational guidelines. It is necessary for that property to have 
uh, integrity, and that's true for all properties uh, that are being discussed. And it is also true for those nominated under criteria one through six, that is the cultural, cri uh, the cultural criteria, to have authentic authenticity. Finally, and just as importantly, and something I think that sometimes uh, gets lost in the discussion, is that there is a need to ensure that there is adequate protection and adequate management to ensure that the property can sustain the value uh, over, uh, over, over time. And therefore, protection and management is also one of the, uh, of, of the key pillars of outstanding universal value. Um, just a word also about criteria. I used to have a slide here which showed a triangle uh, which showed that, um, that you have many different kinds of properties around the world with, with local values, with national values, with regional values, and it's really only those properties that have outstanding universal value that are considered to meet the criteria. And indeed, if you look at the criteria, you'll see words like an outstanding example or a unique example. Um, so obviously, in order to reach this, this level of, 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 of value, it's really something that is, uh, is, is outstanding at an international basis, at a universal basis. And so uh, to meet the criteria, you need, you need to be able to show, to show that in addition to showing the integrity and the authenticity uh, and, and the protection and management. Uh, next slide. And many of you have seen this slide also. If any one of those pillars, and in this case I use protection and management, uh, falls out, then we, d then we don't have outstanding universal value. And you as the committee, when you're making your decisions, um, again, both in terms of, of new nominations, but also in terms of state of conservation, that if there is not the adequate protection and management, it means that outstanding universal value is not present. But again, as I said, that is also true if it doesn't meet the criteria fully or if it does not have adequate integrity and or authenticity. Next slide, please. So uh, to be brief, because I know we, we actually do have to close this session uh, relatively quickly, um, as you know, um, when you're approving new sites on the, on the World Heritage List, you will be asked also to approve a statement of outstanding universal value. And that statement of outstanding universal value will provide a brief synthesis related to the site, talking about what the site is, where it is, uh, and you know why, and why it's why it's important. And in particular, it will also mention uh, many of the attributes or the important attributes of that site, which carry the outstanding universal value. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. We'll keep going. Um, the second part of the statement of outstanding universal value will be the criteria. And for each criteria, there will be a paragraph, and that paragraph will lay out in a very clear and concise manner exactly why this particular property um, uh, meets this particular criteria. And so there will be one for each of the criteria uh, for which the site is inscribed. Next slide, please. And the next one after that. Thank you. Um, there's also a need to show that the property has integrity. And by integrity, we mean that it includes all of the elements necessary to express its outstanding universal value that it is of adequate size to ensure a complete representation of the features, and that it does not suffer adverse effects from development uh, and or neglect. Next slide. For, uh, for cultural uh, properties, as I said, uh, those nominated under criteria one through six, uh, there is also a need to um, uh, to uh, meet the test of authenticity, that is uh, ensuring that the property is, uh, is uh, truthful, uh, that it is genuine, and that its attributes actually do uh, clearly uh, and, and genuinely uh, carry the, the, the values for which it is being inscribed on the World Heritage List. Next slide, please. And finally, as I said, uh, very importantly, is the protection and management. And each of these statements of outstanding universal value will indeed lay out what the framework for protection is for the OUV, what the legal, syst what the legal system is, what the management system is, what the staff resources and financial resources are, and also very importantly, what the long-term challenges are for the protection and management uh, of that particular property. Um, next slide, please. I think that's it, right? So, uh, so it's very important, again, th this is a very brief uh, reminder of outstanding universal value, but it is important to remember that these statements of outstanding universal value 
are the basic documents that you as committee members need to use to assess whether a property actually should be inscribed on the world heritage list but also of great importance when looking at state of conservation issues judging the state of conservation of the property because the statement of outstanding universal value is the is essentially the judge or the is the is the statement that you need to judge the state of conservation by so it's important to understand what that outstanding universal value is thank you very much madam chair and I finished the presentation thank you thank you thank you very much for your very clear presentation I before we pass to the next topic on nominations I would like to know if there are any questions on your side I see none, so I pass the floor to Mr. Balsamo, who will make his uh, expose about nominations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we will go very quickly about this part. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as was said uh, briefly in the Bureau meeting, we have uh, 29 nominations uh, that are scheduled to be examined at this session for the time being five natural, three mixed, and 21 cultural, with 21, uh, 22 new uh, nominations, uh, uh, one uh, significant boundary modification, and six nominations that were deferred or referred in previous session by the committee. Uh, so far, four nominations have been withdrawn, and uh, uh, we have also to discuss after the end of the discussion of nomination, eight minor uh, modification of boundaries. Next slide, please. Here we have the same statistics, but uh, uh, looking at different uh, uh, division between natural, mixed, and cultural uh, uh, nominations. Next slide. And here, the same between different regions. Uh, what uh, uh, is important to underline is that uh, uh, there may still be uh, withdrawals uh, occurring between now and the actual uh, uh, opening of item 8B on Friday. Uh, and uh, we will announce uh, the list of uh, withdrawn uh, uh, nomination at the opening of uh, item 8B on the afternoon of Friday. Next slide. As uh, already uh, announced, the, this is the order of discussion, cultural, mixed, natural, in the, starting from uh, uh, Africa and then on to the other uh, regions uh, and uh, at the end uh, the minor uh, modification of boundaries. Next slide. Uh, in what concerns the related no uh, documentation? Next slide, please. Uh, you have all uh, what you need in order to take your decisions, informed decisions on uh, the website of uh, 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 the center and the special uh, chapter on the uh, 42nd uh, uh, session of the committee, where you can find uh, also uh, the full text of the nomination. Next slide, please. Uh, the uh, evaluation of the advisory bodies, of course, along with the working documents uh, relating uh, to the nomination with the proposed draft decision. Next slide, please. And as I said, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, the full text of all nominations that are still uh, scheduled in the agenda uh, that are available, along with the additional information that was provided uh, during the uh, nomination process uh, and all uh, relevant uh, uh, documentation and uh, uh, correspondence uh, uh, attached to it. Next slide. And next slide. So, uh, talking about the role of uh, the World Heritage Committee, uh, next slide, please. So we like to uh, uh, recall, uh, in, in a short way, uh, paragraph 23 of uh, the operational guidelines uh, that says that committee's decisions are based on objective and scientific considerations, and any appraisal made on its behalf must be truly and responsibly carried out. The committee recognized that such decisions depend upon A, carefully prepared documentation, B, thorough and consistent procedures, C, 
evaluation by qualified experts and the, if necessary, the use of expert referees. Uh, we think that this is uh, really important to uh, underline uh, in terms of uh, what is the role of uh, the committee concerning uh, not only nominations, but uh, uh, in this specific uh, uh, framework we are talking about nomination. Uh, I would like to also to add that uh, uh, it's important to recall that the convention is not intended to ensure the protection of all properties of great interest, importance or value, but only for a select list of the most outstanding of these from an international viewpoint. And also that the committee seeks to establish a representative, a balanced and credible World Heritage List in conformity with the four strategic objectives that were defined in the Budapest Declaration in 2002. Next slide, please. We uh, also uh, think it's very important to just uh, address uh, one of the issues that are, are reoccurring, uh, uh, especially uh, lately in the session of the committee concerning nomination. Uh, uh, a better understanding of what is deferral and referral may help also committee to take uh, better decision. Uh, so we wanted to just uh, uh, remind uh, this difference and uh, say that with referral, uh, basically it, it, it's a case in which there's only a need for a limited amount or minor supplementary additional information. So the nomination text is the same. Uh, there's no need and there, it's not required to make a new nominations. There's no additional mission and uh, normally the boundaries cannot change because the, the, as there is no mission to evaluate them, uh, it will be difficult to, to evaluate new boundaries and uh, no different criteria. Uh, also uh, should uh, be presented under the framework of uh, uh, referral. This is really, really important to keep in mind because uh, uh, lately we have also uh, seen uh, a lot of uh, uh, nomination that were uh, recommended for non-inscription becoming a referral. Uh, and this always created a very, very big problem in a procedural way because, uh, uh, as you may imagine, from a procedural point of view and from a content point of view, uh, these are very, very different procedures. Uh, it's also absolutely important uh, to recall that in compliance uh, with the Convention and the Operational Guidelines, outstanding universal value is recognized at the time of inscription of a property on the World Heritage List, and that no recognition of outstanding universal value is foreseen prior to this stage. That means that within the framework of a referral, there cannot be outstanding universal value recognized. In terms of the deferral, uh, of course, uh, uh, when this decision is taken, it means that uh, the nomination uh, uh, require, require a more in-depth assessment of, of study. Uh, so there is a quite substantial uh, revision that is needed and a new evaluation mission with a new uh, nomination that it has to be submitted. So uh, we see that these are very uh, different mechanisms uh, that should be uh, really used uh, in, a, uh, in a very uh, correct manner. Uh, and uh, uh, these uh, uh, mechanisms are uh, uh, both, li both uh, defined in the operational guidelines and uh, both of them should be seen as uh, constructive options uh, that can assist the state parties, uh, but in these two different ways as we explained. And I can uh, stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. <clears throat> Bausano, for your explanation. I would ask you if there are any questions, any doubts about this uh, specific topic before we move on on our agenda. I see none, so I would pass the floor to Mr. Viyung, who will uh, 
present, make a presentation on state of conservation. Thank you very much. Mr. Billon, you have the floor. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Next slide, please. Let me just uh, make it clear that amongst the 157 state of conservation decisions that you will be taking this year, there are several cases of the potential inscription of uh, properties on the uh, list of uh, World Heritage and Danger. It's important to understand that an inscription on that list is a call for action and uh, would bring uh, several benefits. But rather than give you a lengthy speech, let me show you a video film uh, made by the National Parks of Colombia on the inscription of the Los Catios National Park on the World Heritage and Danger list and how that inscription was beneficial not just to the property itself but also to the local community surrounding it. Film, please. Creado en 1973, tiene una superficie de mil hectáreas y está ubicado en el noroccidente de Colombia, en la región del Darién y Urabá, en los departamentos de Chocó y Antioquia. Limita en el occidente con Panamá, específicamente con el Parque Nacional del Darién, con el que comparte el título de Patrimonio Mundial Natural y Reserva de la Biosfera. Por esto, es también un paso importante para millones de especies y representa un legado cultural invaluable. El parque tiene conexión directa de un complejo de ciénagas y humedales con selva muy húmeda tropical. Tiene ríos muy importantes como el Atrato, Cacarica y Pelle y un alto grado de endemismo y biodiversidad. Por ejemplo, a pesar de representar una pequeña área del territorio colombiano, tiene cerca del 30% de las aves registradas para el país. Para las comunidades étnicas, indígenas y afrodescendientes, el Parque Los Catíos tiene un significado muy interesante. No solo porque de allí derivan unos y otros su supervivencia, sino porque tiene una importancia de tipo cultural y espiritual. Para ellos, el Parque Los Catíos tiene muchos sitios sagrados que le aporta a su riqueza espiritual. Por estos motivos que hacen del área protegida un sitio excepcional en cuanto a procesos ecológicos y biológicos, fue declarada Sitio de Patrimonio Natural Mundial por la UNESCO en 1994. Asimismo, el parque tiene una rica variedad de ecosistemas, incluyendo bosques tropicales y pantanosos, colinas bajas y planicies aluviales, que constituyen hábitats naturales para la conservación in situ de la diversidad biológica. Por su ubicación estratégica y aislada, el sitio es refugio para una gran cantidad de especies, 450 de aves, más de 550 de vertebrados y 669 de plantas. Gracias a todo ese trabajo que realizan los funcionarios del parque, nos ayudan a nosotros y al tema de la conservación de los recursos hidrobiológicos y los recursos pesqueros que se encuentran al interior del parque. En el pasado, el impacto de la deforestación, la degradación de ecosistemas estratégicos como los humedales, la reconversión de los suelos para usos como agricultura dentro y fuera del parque, el conflicto social con comunidades reasentadas en él y la imposibilidad del Estado de ejercer de manera segura la autoridad ambiental en el territorio, sumado a las amenazas por posibles megaproyectos atravesando el área, afectaron la integridad del área protegida. Es así como el gobierno de Colombia, luego de consultas con el Centro de Patrimonio Mundial y la Unión Internacional para la Conservación de la Naturaleza, en su rol de órgano asesor para sitios naturales, solicitó en el año 2009 al Comité de Patrimonio Mundial la inclusión del área dentro de la lista de sitios de patrimonio mundial en peligro. Se enfatizó la necesidad de movilizar apoyos a nivel local, 
regional, nacional e internacional para resolver la situación que ponía en riesgo el valor universal excepcional del sitio Patrimonio Mundial. Durante los siguientes años, Parques Nacionales Naturales de Colombia desarrolló un esquema de medidas correctivas, el cual se denominó Plan de Choque con las siguientes acciones estratégicas. Mejorar la actividad de control y vigilancia, mejorando la infraestructura, la asignación de personal y la articulación con la fuerza pública. Generar acuerdos de uso y manejo de recursos naturales con las comunidades afrodescendientes que utilizan los recursos naturales. Generar un proceso de reconocimiento a las comunidades indígenas que se encuentran al interior y en la zona de influencia del área. Hacer una gestión interinstitucional con las alcaldías, las corporaciones regionales y las entidades del sector pesquero para articular acciones en la defensa y protección del parque. Hacer una gestión para incidir en que los proyectos de infraestructura no afectaran el área protegida. Esta estrategia también involucró definitivamente a la comunidad local, a las autoridades locales, para poder superar los problemas del parque. Ellos entendieron también que estando en la lista de patrimonio en peligro debían participar activamente en las estrategias que llevaran a superar los problemas para lograr que la, el Comité de la UNESCO decidiera sacarlo de la lista de patrimonio en peligro. Este proceso ha sido muy interesante porque ha sido una estrategia desde la unidad de, de parques nacionales en donde se ha integrado mucho con las comunidades, no solamente mirando el parque como un objeto intocable, e impenetrable pues hacia las, las áreas como tal, sino que han venido haciendo durante mucho tiempo y nosotros hemos sido acompañantes en algunas actividades. Eh, se ha venido haciendo un trabajo muy interesante con las comunidades con influencia directa en el parque, eh, las que están en la zona de amortiguamiento, algunas que viven al interior del parque y eso ha permitido una, una compenetración muy importante, una articulación eh, fuerte entre las comunidades y la institucionalidad. La comunidad entre todos, la, el territorio colectivo de los pueblos negros, eh, estuvimos una relación conjunta con el Parque Nacional, tanto los pueblos indígenas que están más cercana del parque, hicimos una actividad eh, con la comunidad, llevando el proceso como de concientizar a las personas de la misma comunidad más cercana o alrededor del parque, como el pueblo indígena, Cunadule, que está más cercana, y, y el territorio colectivo. Este plan fue posteriormente revisado y ajustado en el marco de la misión de evaluación de la UICN realizada en el año 2011, y se establecieron actividades adicionales, así como indicadores específicos para responder ante las amenazas reportadas. Con base en este nuevo plan de actividades, se estableció el estado deseado de conservación, que es el mapa de ruta formalmente considerado por la UNESCO para demostrar el progreso en alcanzar las metas. Una o varias estrategias fueron identificadas para mitigar cada una de estas amenazas. Se articularon alianzas, procesos, recursos y personal de distintas autoridades y organizaciones con miras a superar el estado crítico y alcanzar nuevamente el estatus de protección deseado. Como parte de este proceso, se elaboró también la Declaración Retrospectiva de Valor Universal Excepcional, la cual rescata los principales valores, integridad, manejo y perspectivas a largo plazo acerca del sitio. Una suerte de carta de presentación en la que se resaltan las cualidades por las que es considerado patrimonio de la humanidad. Tras el arduo trabajo de recuperación, siguiendo las recomendaciones del comité y como paso definitivo para alcanzar la meta de retirar al parque de la lista en peligro, se invitó a una misión de evaluación reactiva por parte de la UICN a comienzos del año 2015. De acuerdo a las observaciones y hallazgos del experto de la misión, se recomendó la salida del parque de la categoría en peligro, considerando que las intervenciones en el área protegida habían dado frutos en materia de conservación. 
Para Colombia, la inclusión del Parque Nacional en la lista de patrimonio en peligro es una oportunidad. No lo hemos tomado nunca como un castigo. Hemos analizado los postulados de la convención y nos damos cuenta de que es la oportunidad para diseñar una estrategia que nos lleve a superar los problemas del parque. En este sentido, en el marco de la 39 sesión del Comité de Patrimonio Mundial de la UNESCO, celebrado en junio de 2015, se adoptó la decisión de retirar el Parque Nacional Natural Los Catíos de la lista de patrimonio en peligro. Consideramos que se han hecho unos esfuerzos interdisciplinarios. Inicialmente el, la, la, las mismas personas del parque eh, le, han, le han puesto todo el interés para que realmente eh, en el parque vuelva a ser lo que realmente debe de ser. Todo esto también ha, ha, ha surtido un efecto muy importante porque también ha permitido de que regrese la seguridad al parque. La decisión reconoció los esfuerzos del Estado colombiano para lograr el estado deseado de conservación, superando la adversidad y cohesionando socialmente el territorio, lo cual sin duda constituye un avance fundamental en el manejo efectivo y la gobernanza equitativa del área protegida. Así se hizo y creo que con éxito pudimos superar la mayoría de los problemas más graves que tenía el Parque Nacional. Nuestro compromiso ahora es seguirlo manejando de manera efectiva con la autoridad regional y local y parques nacionales cuidando nuestro Parque Nacional Patrimonio de la Humanidad. Para que el parque esté en donde está necesitamos que el gobierno lo siga apoyando, así como lo está haciendo ahora o con más fuerza, para que así también el parque apoye a nuestra comunidad para salir adelante, porque queremos que el parque fortalezca también los proyectos que ha dado o que se den otros proyectos para la comunidad de Tumarado y para otras también. Eh, hay otro aspecto que es muy, muy importante, es el de control y vigilancia. Yo creo que cada vez... Eh... Todos aquellos que están metidos en el tráfico se las van ingeniando, entonces no podemos creer que ya tenemos solucionado el problema por, el, por nuestro aplicativo y digamos que por la articulación que tenemos con Chocó y Corpo Brava. Tenemos que ser todavía más sagaces y, tener que, y estar revisando que efectivamente lo que está haciendo documental eh, corresponda a la realidad y eso significa más seguimiento en campo. Todo lo anterior no habría sido ni será posible sin el trabajo del equipo de Parques Nacionales Naturales de Colombia que desde las distintas competencias y capacidades ha dispuesto de los recursos requeridos para alcanzar estos logros, preservar la salud de los ecosistemas y los beneficios para la comunidad de los departamentos de Antioquia y Chocó, cruciales en todo el proceso para avanzar el plan de choque y con quienes será fundamental trabajar frente a los mencionados retos en beneficio de los colombianos y a disposición de toda la humanidad. Bravo. Uh, I, before we close our session, and after this magnificent presentation. I would like to know if there are any questions on your side concerning the state of conservation. I see none, so I believe we can close the session for today so that we have time to move around and uh, be on time for the reception. Uh, in our program later on. Thank you very much for your attention.